ಶ್ರೀಮತ್ತಿಭಕ್ತಿವರಾಂತಸ್ವಾಮೀತಿಮೇನಸ್ತೈಸ್ವರಿಗೆ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರಿ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರಿ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರಿ ಹರಿ philosophical uh, teaching by Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. For about 20 verses, he very systematically and with great detail explains the difference between the body and the soul and the difference between matter and spirit, the difference between what is eternal and what is temporary. Now this verse here from the Bhagavatam is a very uh, philosophical, scientific approach to understanding that answer, how we can understand we are not this body. If you carefully follow along with this uh, reading and think about what I'm saying while you while I'm reading it and follow along, you'll be able to understand a lot more about this principle of being different from the body. It's what we say empirically perceived. Empirical means factually observable. You can understand you're not this body, or you can understand you're different from this body, you. Bhagavan Sarvabhute Shu Lakshitam Sarmana Harihi Drishya Budya Dibir Drasta Lakshanair Anuma Ankai. The personality of Godhead Lord Krishna is in every living being along with the individual soul. And this fact is perceived and hypothesized in our acts of seeing and taking help from the intelligence. So here's how you understand it. By seeing through the intelligence. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Carefully follow along. The general argument of the common man is that since the Lord is not visible to ours, how can one either surrender unto him or render transcendental love and service to him? Such, to such a common man, here is a practical suggestion given by Srila Sukadeva Goswami as to how one can perceive the Supreme Lord by reason and perception. Not only the soul, but the Lord. Actually, the Lord is not perceivable by our present materialized senses. But when one is convinced of the presence of the Lord by a practical service attitude, there is a revelation by the Lord's mercy and such a devotee of the Lord can perceive the Lord presence everywhere and always. He can perceive, he can perceive that intelligence is the form direction of the Paramatma plenary portion of the personality of Godhead. I'll read that again. One can perceive that intelligence is the form direction of the Paramatma plenary portion of the personality of Godhead. The presence of Paramatma in everyone's company is not very difficult to realize, hmm. even for the common man. The procedure is as follows. So here we go. One can perceive one's self-identification and feel positively that he exists. So we can understand I exist. 
He may not feel it very abruptly, but by using a little intelligence, he can feel that he is not the body. He can feel that the, that the hand, the leg, the head, the hair, and the limbs are, the, are all his bodily parts and parcels. But as such, the hand, the leg, and the head cannot be identified with the self. Therefore, just by using intelligence, he can distinguish and separate his self from other things that he sees. So the natural conclusion is that the living being, either man or beast, is the seer, and he sees besides himself all other things. So we're seeing, and we're seeing other things. So there is a difference between the seer, you, and what is being seen. Now, by a little use of intelligence, we can also readily agree that the living being who sees the things beyond himself by ordinary vision has no power to see or to move independently. Try, here we go. By a little use of intelligence, we can readily agree that the living being us, the soul, who sees things beyond himself by ordinary vision has no power to see or to move independently. All our ordinary actions and perceptions depend on various forms of energy supplied by us by nature in various combina combinations. Our senses of perception, of action, that is to say our five perceptive senses, hearing, touch, sight, taste, and smell, as well as our five senses of action, namely the hands, the legs, speech, evacuation organs, and reproductive organs are all our three subtle senses, namely the mind, intelligence, and ego, 13 senses in all. So here we go. We have the, the five working, we have the six working senses, the five knowledge acquiring senses and the mind, intelligence, and ego all together 13, five, five, and three, all supplied to us by various arrangements of gross and subtle forms of natural energy. And it is equally evident that our objects of perception are nothing but the products of the inexhaustible permutations and combinations of the forms taken by natural energy. Did you get that? It is equally evident that our objects of perceptions, what we're perceiving, are nothing but the products of the inexhaustible permutations and common, common combinations of forms taken by the material energy. So what we perceive are structured in a different way and combined in a different way, not by us, by something outside of us. All this conclusively proves that the ordinary living being has no independent power of perception or of motion. So things are moving around us and we are perceiving them. And as we undoubtedly feel our existence by conditioned by nature's energy, we conclude that he who sees is spirit, or you might say he who sees is different than what is being seen in quality. Because we, we don't move around, but we are perceiving things that are moving around us and that are part of us known as our bodily senses. And that the senses well, as well as the objects of perception are material. They're material because they're always changing. The, the spiritual quality of the seer is manifested, is manifest in our dissatisfaction with the limited state of material conditional existence. So we can see from our per perception of the soul that material nature is limited. This is the difference between spirit and matter. There are some less intelligent arguments that matter develops the power of seeing and moving as a certain organic development. So they've, some people believe that once as matter starts to combine and move, it develops its own power. But such an argument cannot be accepted because there is no experimental evidence that matter has anywhere produced a living soul, life. Trust no future, however pleasant. 
idle talks regarding future movement of matter into spirit are actually foolish because no matter has ever developed the power of seeing or moving in any part of the world. We see with our eyes, but we don't see with our eyes. We see we are perceiving the world through our eyes and that is called sight. We are hearing sound through our ears and that is called hearing. So these are instruments for perception, but they are not, uh, the, they don't have independent power to work. If the mind is not functioning, the senses cannot perceive, although there may be sound and sight available, they cannot be perceived because um, matter cannot move independently. Therefore, it is definite that matter and spirit are two different entities. And this conclusion is arrived, let me see, at, arrived at by the use of intelligence. Yeah, okay, no need for that. Now we come to the point that the things which are seen by a little use of intelligence cannot be animate unless we accept someone as the user or director of the intelligence. In other words, if there's no one seeing anything, and there's no intelligence behind the seeing power, there's no objects to see. <laughs> intelligence gives one direction like some higher authority. And the living being cannot see or move or eat or do anything without the use of intelligence. So we keep coming back to intelligence, which is discrimination. When, when, when one fails to take advantage of intelligence, he becomes a deranged man. And so a living being is dependent on intelligence or the direction of a superior being. So intelligence is either coming through developed development or through superior forces. Such intelligence is all pervading. Every living being has his intelligence. His intelligence being the direction is being the direction of some higher authority. It's just like a father giving direction to the son. So the use of intelligence comes from higher principles. The higher authority who is present and residing within every living being is the super soul of Krishna in the heart. Okay. I hope you're with me. It's a little philosophical, but try to stay with it. At this point in our investigation, we may consider the following question. On the one hand, we realize that all of our perceptions and activities are conditioned by arrangements of material nature. Yet we also ordinarily feel and say, I am perceiving or I am doing. Therefore, we can say that our material senses of perception and action are moving because we are identifying the self with the material body. And that the superior principle of super self is guiding and supplying us according to our desire. Did you get that? We can say that our material senses of perception, perception and action, these are the five, uh, you know, sound, touch, feel, taste, smell, legs, arms, belly, uh, rectum and genitals. These are the 10 senses. Therefore, we can say that our material senses of perception and action, in other words, the mind and are moving because we are identifying the self with the material body. And that the superior principle Super cell is guiding and supplying us according to our desire. So accordingly, we are getting an understanding of what is happening around us from another source. By taking advantage of the guidance of the super soul in the form of intelligence, here we go, we can either continue to study and, and to put into practice our, our conclusion that I am not this body, or we can choose to remain in the false material identification, fancying ourselves to be the possessors and doers. Our freedom consists in orienting our desire towards the ignorant material misconception or to the true spiritual conception. So we can move, we can say that everything that's moving around me, 
is different than me and everything that is part of my body is also me. We can easily attain to the true spiritual conception by recognizing the super soul to be our friend and guide and by dovetailing our intelligence with the superior intelligence of Paramahama. The super soul and the individual soul are both spirit. And therefore the super self and the individual self are both qualitatively one and distinct from matter. So within our purview of existence, there are two living entities, us, the perceiver and the director of action and the guider of action, or the one who gives direction to our action, the super soul. Both of these are distinct from matter because they are fixed. But the super soul and the individual soul cannot be on an equal level because the super self all gives direction or supplies intelligence. And we, the individual soul, follow that direction and thus actions are performed properly. So we're getting intelligence from another source. The so we, the soul, are perceiving, and perceiving or receiving intelligence, but then there's a source of that intelligence, and that is a higher form of intelligence. Here, it's understood as the super soul. The individual is completely dependent on the direction of the super soul because in every step, the it shall follow the direction of the super soul in the matter of seeing, hearing, thinking, willing, etc. So in other words, when we want to know something, we think about it and then we get some understanding. We want to hear something, we direct our senses in that direction. We want to do something, we, we function in that. In other words, we, the intelligence is moving the bodily senses and the mind in a certain direction being directed by a higher power. Continuation, so far as common sense is concerned, we come to the conclusion that there are three identities. Here we go. Namely matter, spirit, and super spirit, or Paramatma. Now, if we go to the Bhagavad Gita or the Vedic intelligence, we can further understand that all three identities, namely matter, Individual spirit and super spirit are all dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So now we're taking help from Shastra. The super self is a partial representation of the plenary portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Bhagavad Gita affirms that the Supreme Personality of Godhead dominates over the material world by his partial representation only. So the Lord manifests himself as himself, as the super soul, which says here, it's a partial representation of himself. It is not the full nature of the Supreme Lord, although it is non different than the Lord. God is great and he cannot be simply an order supplier to the individual selves. Therefore the super self cannot be a full representation of the Supreme Self, Guru Shokna the absolute person. Why can he not be the full self? Because he's simply granting our desires where the supreme absolute personality of God does not grant our desires. He directs us according to his desire. Realization of the super self by the individual self is the beginning of self-realization. And by the process of such self-realization, one is able to realize the personality of Godhead by intelligence, by the help of authorized scriptures, principally by the grace of the Lord. The Bhagavad Gita is the preliminary conception of the personality of God as Sri, Sri Krishna, and Srimad Bhagavatam is the further explanation of the science of Godhead. So if we stick to our determination and pray for the mercy of the director of intelligence, sitting within the same bodily tree, like a bird sitting with another bird, as explained in the Upanishads, certainly the purport of the revealed information in the Vedas becomes clear to our vision. And there's no difficulty in realizing the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudev. The intelligent man, therefore, after many births of such use of intelligence, surrenders himself at the lotus feet of Vasudev as confirmed by the Bhagavad Gita 
Bahunang Jamana Manti Gyanama Man Prabhadyante Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sadur Labaha. After many, many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me the cause of all causes and all it is. Such a such a such a great soul, such a such a personality is considered a Mahatma, a great soul. Mm -hmm. So a little difficult to understand. But if you read it again and over and over again, you'll see how you can perceive yourself different from yourself as the body and know that you are something different than the body. Uh, like I said, we see through the eyes. The eyes don't see. They are instruments to help us see but we are doing the seeing. Who are we? That's the question. We are seeing. The eyes are not, we are not the eyes, they are instruments. We are not the ears, which are hearing instruments, but we can hear with the help of the ears. We take help from the bodily parts in order to function, both giving to the external energy and receiving from the external energy. The external energy is moving and combining in different forms of itself to produce death various manifestations and permutations. But we don't change. And Prabhupada would always give that understanding. You can remember when you were a little boy or girl, but that body is no longer there. You become older, and now you, then you had a youth body. Maybe now you're middle aged or even older. So the perception of our different phases of life, as far as our different bodily changes, is perceiving by is being perceived by something outside of all the changes. There's something that doesn't change that is perceiving the changes. And where is that knowledge of perception coming from that 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 element is receiving these this knowledge to discriminate and to understand and against and also to function within that is coming from the super soul. So the super soul is sitting in the heart. That's God. He's a partial manifestation of God. He's called the Antaryami, the director. He directs us according to our desire. Whatever our desire is, he gives us the intelligence by way we can fulfill that desire. Even you can see that. How is it that such people that are so evil and so ill-spirited who are have who like to cause trouble to others, they have great intelligence in order to do that. Where are they getting that intelligence from? The intelligence is coming from the same source. When Prahlad Maharaj was asked by his father, who had tried to kill him in so many ways, you know, where do you get your power from? You know, I'm you know, I've tried to kill Kill you in so many ways, but I can't do it. <laughs> Everybody runs from me simply by my appearance, and you, you're completely fearless, and you have such power. Where are you getting that power from? He was incredulous seeing his own little five year old son's power. And Prahlad Maharaj just simply answered, I get my power from the same place you get your power, the same place where everybody gets the power. There's only one source. <laughs> Krishna, Vishnu. Of course, Harani Kashipu didn't want to hear that. He kept saying, my power is my power. But we understand that knowledge, power, resourcefulness, intelligence, um, discrimination, which is a feature of intelligence, uh, all of these are coming from a higher source. And that higher source is Krishna in the heart known as the super self, as it's said here. We also call it the super soul. And the English manifestation of the same principle, the English, the, um, the uh, Western transcendentalists, they call it the oversoul. Walt Whitman and Waldo, Waldorf Emerson, they called it the oversoul. In other words, they had the understanding that yes, there's another soul that sits within the body along with the individual soul. 
and giving direction like that. Sarvashya Jahamradi Sani Visto Matat Smirti Agyanama Pohanam Cha Vedaish Sar Savam Aham Veda Vedo Vedanta Krit Veda Veda Eva Chaham Krishna says, if you want knowledge, I supply it. If you want intelligence, I give it. If you want to forget, I can help you do that also. So the Lord in the heart is supplying the intelligence to fulfill our desires. And our desires are not something that is outside of us. They are coming within. Everything about us are external. The body has senses. It has mind. It has activities. But these are all separate from us who is the perceiving. Sometimes we do a very simple explanation. When I go to prisons, I like to do this particular explanation because I usually speak many times when I speak to the inmates in the prisons. I want to let them understand that they're not this body. So I go through this little exercise. And, uh, you know, I can go through it with you right now. You, I can't see you performing the exercise, but I can run you through the exercise. Okay, you ready? Everybody ready? Get ready for the exercise. All you have to do is respond to my request. Uh, take your hand and point to your head. Okay, now take your hand and point to your left arm. Point to your right leg. Point to your ear. Point to your chest. Now here's the question. Now point to you. And this is where people get confused. They think, or they put point to their whole body. I say, no, that's just your body or wherever they're pointing. I point out that's the part of that body. So when we try to indicate who we are by indicating ourself in the external sense, we don't come up with anything. We remain confused to blank. But we are perceiving all of what is around us. We are the perceiver, but we are not the object of perception. We are the seer, but not the seen. So we're seeing our body moving in action, but we are different. We are watching it, we're perceiving it, we're interacting with it, we're even directing it. But then again, Prabhupada takes it a step farther and says that that ability to direct accordingly is coming from another source, or we might say two sources, either Paramatma or Shastra or scripture, which is Krishna in the form of literary knowledge. So study this particular purport and understand the dynamics of how this is being explained. And you can understand simply by uh, the knowledge of this purport that you are different from your body. You are different from your body. Therefore, from this, you can understand that, yes, I am something other than my material body. It becomes empirically observable through in intelligence applied by higher knowledge. Otherwise, we take simply to simply take scripture, just like uh, we give another example. When you go to sleep at night, you, you might dream. And in the dream, you might also see yourself within the dream. So you're dreaming and you're perceiving your conception of yourself through your known understanding of your own body in the dream. And then again, we ask the question, who? Who is the real one? The one that's in the dream or the one that's perceiving you in the dream? Obviously, there is two different uh, features there. One is the seer and one is the perceiver. So the, I mean, one is the seen. So we see that in dreams it becomes a little bit clearer. We can understand it in a dream. And you see that when you wake up from the dream, what happened in the dream didn't happen to you. Although it's more like watching a movie about yourself. 
and you're going through it. And a lot of times you're also going through an emotional turmoil in the dream as you're experiencing what's happening in the dream. But still, you're still, you, oh, you remain separate from that whole thing because when you wake up, you are something different than what you experienced in your dream. So in this way, we, we get uh, different indications of how we can see ourselves different from all matter. We are not matter. We, uh, cause matter has no, um, uh, what we say volition of its own. It cannot move. Matter is dead, but it is moving through the interaction of spirit with matter. And that interaction comes by the mind and the intelligence. It's moving matter like that. But it's, it's directed by the super soul, who is the ultimate principle of uh, motion or action. In other words, even if we want to move matter through our own intelligence and activity, if Krishna doesn't want it to move or Krishna doesn't want it to happen in the way we want it to happen, it won't <laughs> because we require that intelligence coming from him and him, he is ultimately not only supplying the intelligence, but he is the force behind the activity. So even though the intelligence may also work, if the super intelligence or the super soul doesn't give direction or has a different direction, then it'll come out differently or it won't come out at all. So in that sense, you can always say, you can understand that we are always controlled. We are always controlled. But to understand where is the spiritual benefit in this whole thing, we want to be controlled by Krishna. That's, that's the whole thing that we come back to accepting his control as the only form of control in our life that is devotional service. So we, are, we become controlled by Krishna by accepting devotional service to him. And we come under his controlled spiritual energy, which is the energy that lifts us in association with the Supreme Lord. And we remain, then we remain free because matter is limited and matter is, uh, because it's limited, it can keeps our control or our freedom within a certain realm. We just, for instance, we cannot do what we want without getting a certain reaction in a certain direction. If we somehow go outside of the laws of material nature, Prabhupada will always use the example you have something to eat and you decide to eat a lot of it and then because you have you ate a lot of it your digestion is is uh, is slowed down or maybe you you get indigestion and therefore you have to take some medicine or you have to fast so within the realm of matter we are always restricted and limited but by taking shelter of krishna in devotional service because he is above the material energy we can also free ourselves from the, the reactions of matter. And that's when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We are moving our consciousness away from the material and into the spiritual, into the association of the Lord. And in that level of existence, we become free. Free from the restrictions that matter places upon us and the punishments that matter gives us when we, when we work within the three modes of material nature. So we are pure spirit. Krishna is also pure spirit. And everything around us has nothing to do with us. Look around you and see what anything you have that has anything to do with you. And what is it? What does it have to do with you? The, the, uh, the desire that we place upon it. Just like if we have a particular possession. So we say, oh, that's mine. Because we have some of the desire to use it or to enjoy it. 
but we see another possession that is not within our you know purview or within our uh, our life and we say well it has nothing to do with me it's somebody else's but that's true with anything so the desire we place on matter connects us to that matter soon as we take our desire away from that matter soon as we give up the desire to enjoy and control that matter then we are free from the reactions that come about through the contact with that material energy. And that way we can free ourselves. Mm. Um, what would be, just like we have this example, uh, Socrates. Socrates, he was a great Greek philanthropist, thinker, and he also had real. He also also had Brahman realization. He knew he was not this body, and he was preaching that during the time when the church was very much against the idea of reincarnation, and you know, simply saying that well, when you're born, you get one life, and if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you die, you go to hell. I mean, if you're bad, you go to hell. Well, that's pretty much it. But he was preaching, no, this is not our first life. And we have many lives in front of us. And so when he was preaching like that, the church became quite disturbed. And they threatened him. That if he doesn't stop, there would be some punishment. But because he was in knowledge, because he, he understood his knowledge was truth, and he wanted to enlighten other people with that knowledge, he continued. And then at one point they arrested and put him in prison and they subjected him to death by drinking poison, kind of poison called hemlock. So they said, uh, Socrates, what should we do with you at, when, once you die? In other words, what do we do with you, your body? He said, well, uh, as far as my body is concerned, you can do anything you want with that. But as far as I'm concerned, you have to catch me. So he knew once he leaves the body, he's going somewhere else. So that is knowledge. The knowledge that we are different than everything matter. And this is the principle of renunciation. Therefore, we can renounce anything because we know that anything outside of our existence in other words, anything material has nothing to do with us. The only thing it has to do with us is that the value we place upon it. And so when we change that value or, we sh or shift that value to something else, that former object has no meaning. And it's just like if you have something, some say you have a set of car keys and you lose your car keys. You think, oh, what am I going to do now? So you get another set. So the other set is gone. You have a new set. So you give up your attachment to the old set. Or you, a better example would be, say you had some personal item that you really liked and somebody sp stole it. And you think, oh, I lost this personal item. It's so nice. I really liked it. But then again, you went on in life and you lived without it. And somehow or other, and time goes on, you forget about it. And it's not even there anymore. But while we have it and while, while we're using it, it seems to be so valuable. But when it's gone and we have no connection with it, it doesn't have any value anymore. So that's true with everything material. What we place upon it is the value we give it. And as soon as we take that uh, attachment away from that or the usage of the, uh, that, that particular item away from it, it has no more meaning in our life. So this is true with matter. All matter cannot touch us, does not touch us and cannot give us any happiness because it is dead. It is jada. It is simply a combination of elements that have no life in, in itself. 
So when we, and that, that includes our body also. Our body does not have any, have any life. The life that the body appears to have is simply the animation it receives from the soul's presence, that's all. We can think, we can react, we can act, we can do so many things simply because the soul is present. When the soul leaves, everything changes. There's no more attachment. And there is no more activity on that level. So this verse helps us to, to understand the principle of renunciation. We can live with anything, every, without anything, except we cannot live without God. Because God is of the same nature we are. And we have a connection with God in devotion, where we might say in love where you cannot love anything in this world because everything in this world is matter. You say, well, I love my husband, I love my children. But what is your husband and children? It's a body, like your body made of a combination of elements. Can you love that earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence? Can you love that? These are simply material elements that have no animation and no reality. What you're loving is you're loving that object within the body, which is the soul. There's where your love is being placed, although you think in terms of the physical aspect of that person now, person. We get attracted, oh, this is so beautiful. Oh, this is not so nice. But that's matter, matter changes. One time it looks attractive, another time it doesn't look so attractive. But there's a force moving matter, and that is the soul. So because we are spiritual, we cannot connect with or identify with anything that is not of our same nature. Therefore, we have no connection with matter at all. But we can use matter because matter is Krishna's energy in the service of Krishna. And there's where the value comes in. When we want to offer something to the Lord, we can take the offering of what he gives us and offer it back to him. And what devotion, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushram Falam Tayam Yome Bhakta Panasati, Tadaham Bhakta Uparitam Asnami Vayatat Manaha. He doesn't say, you know, give me a lot of money or give me a big building. He says, a leaf of flower, fruit, and water but with devotion. So what he's saying is that you can offer anything in this world to me, only that has value when it's offered with devotion. And everything that you're offering is, belongs to him anyway, because he's the one that created, he is the source of it. Bhaktaram yagyatrapasam sarvaloka maheshwaram. He is the source of everything. Aham sarvasya prabhavo matat sarvaloka He is the source of Everything, spiritual and matter. So just so I'll give you an example. Those of you who have some knowledge, either born in India or have some knowledge of Vedic culture, you know that people who worship the Ganges, how do they worship the Ganges? They go to the Ganges, they scoop up a, a, a handful of Ganges water, they hold it in their hands, they recite some prayers in, in devotion to the Ganges and they pour the water back into the Ganges while they're reciting the prayer. So they're taking the Ganges water and offering it back to the Ganges. But what's the difference? The prayer, that's all. And that's the, that is the essential difference. So nothing in this world belongs to us. Nothing in this world can be enjoyed by us. Everything is coming from the source of its existence, the one who put everything in existence, the Supreme Lord himself. And therefore, that's freedom. Therefore, we can use whatever Krishna gives us in Krishna's service. And if we lose something, we don't lose anything because there's always something to offer to Krishna. There are so many things we can offer to Krishna. And we can do without everything if you go just say you go to say you commit a crime don't do it of course 
when you go to jail and you're no longer having your house, you no longer have your car, you no longer have your computer, you no longer have your, you know, a lot of the things that you used to have. But sometimes, somehow you're going on, you're living, but you're living without these things. So these things have value because they can give us opportunities for service to the Supreme. Otherwise, they have no relationship to us at all. They're simply dead matter. And we are pure spirit. That's the difference. So study this particular purport, read it over and over and over again. And each time you read it, you'll start to understand more of what Prabhupada is saying in relationship to knowledge, intelligence, discrimination, perception, and distinction between the soul and the body. <laughs> And unless we understand we're not this body, we cannot go to higher knowledge. That we must understand. That's why Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita begins his instructions to Arjuna. What is the first thing he says? Uh, as the embodied soul goes from boyhood to youth to old age, similarly, the soul go, uh, travels into another body of death. And the self-realized soul that this is not bewildered by such a change. Never was a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future, so any of us cease to be. Krishna, one verse after another, for 20 verses, He's giving, he's laying the foundation for higher knowledge. So this, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, starting with verse number uh, 12 and going all the way on, gives us the understanding of the difference between us, the soul, and everything else around us matter. And that is the foundation for understanding the nature of the Supreme Lord. Because unless we come to the platform of understanding we are something different than matter, we can't understand the Supreme Lord who is completely distinct from matter. Okay, so at least we should have a, a good theoretical understanding of this principle. Therefore, to, to cap my statement, there's nothing in this world that, to enjoy and there's nothing in this world to renounce. There's nothing in this world to enjoy. There's nothing in this world to renounce. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for such a wonderful uh, class today. Uh, very deep. Uh, uh, purport with uh, deep philosophy. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. I request devotees if they have any questions or comments or realizations, they can go ahead now. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my Humble obeisances, all glory to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, first of all, I would like to thank you for this wonderful explanation. Indeed, it was very technical when you said it. It was technical. I didn't expect it to be that this technical. So I will have to go through it again, Maharaj, the purports and the class to comprehend it uh, much better. But I think this is very nicely explained scientifically how we can preach but also perceive ourselves not to be the body. Uh, so this is useful for preaching, uh, technical, but yeah. very useful. So thank, thank you, Maharaj. Very useful for preaching. Good. Thank you. It requires reading and rereading. And as you keep doing it, you'll start to pick up more and more of the points. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. 
Prabhupada used to say, if you don't understand anything, something, read it again. And keep reading it. As you continue to read it, the understanding becomes more and more clear. Some people say they, they hear something or they read something and they say, I don't understand it. Read it again. Hear it again. Each time you read it, each time you hear it, think about what you're hearing, what you're reading. Think that thinking power is your discriminating power, which is the, which is the sign of intelligence. And that intelligence is being fed by higher knowledge, which is Krishna or the super soul. So Maharaj, one, one thing to clarify, uh, just to add, is whatever the impetus is coming to the intelligence, using the intelligence, we are discriminating. So that intelligence, that, that the drive is coming from the super soul. Right, Maharaj? Yeah. That is what, yes. Yeah. yeah the okay. intelligence is the connection between the soul and the super soul, not the mind. The mind has to be directed by intelligence. Intelligence has to be purified by Shastra or by Guru. Mm -hmm. There is material intelligence too. The demons are very intelligent. Prabhupada says the demons are very intelligent materially. They know how to manipulate matter in order to get what they want. Of course, their manipulation has their consequences and they suffer from that manipulation, but still they use their intelligence in a manipulative way to control people, to control, to try to control the material energy. So demons have great intelligence because they have, they have fine tuned their intelligence to understand how matter works. That's why they, we say this knowledge in the hands of the demons is very dangerous. But they understand. Mm -hmm. And Maharaj, just one other thing to clarify. When somebody obviously has a desire to know the supreme person or god then the super soul will know the desire and will direct that person either to the association of devotees or to the right books so that they can know god or know krishna uh, so the intelligence is directed that way uh, what happens uh, when people are misdirected towards false guru or false religion or false philosophy that intelligence is also then directed driven by desires by the super soul itself so the super soul can direct based on the desires yeah based on the desire if you want a if you want a real guru you'll get one but if you want something less than a real one in other words you want to be spiritual but you want to enjoy matter also you'll get a guru like that so you have to you have to examine your desire do you want the real thing or do you want something less than that and the first you have to know what is the real thing. So those who want pure devotional service will be led to a spiritual master who will give them that. Those who want devotional service and still want to have some connection with the material world to enjoy, they'll get knowledge based on that. But then again, there is a there is another feature where Krishna becomes very merciful and he gives you the pure knowledge, even if you don't want it. But the, the question is because you don't have that pure desire, you, you may not be able to accept it or understand it. Just like we speak to many people, some 
are completely surrenders and some uh, are not. And they're hearing what you say according to their own desires. So that they filter the knowledge in that way. So we have to examine the sincerity or, or the purity of our own desire. Do we want Krishna or do we want Krishna and material happiness at the same time? So yeah, your, your point is, is completely correct. But then again, it's all based on the desire of the living entity, how, how you receive what you receive, how you receive what's given to you. Many, per many persons came in contact with Prabhupada, but many couldn't recognize, you know, the quality of Prabhupada's spiritual, you know, uh, acumen. His pie, you know, some saw him as a great soul, but others saw him as a pure representative of Krishna. Others understood that he came from the spiritual world, and others seen, others thought, saw him as just some nice sadhu that happened to come at a certain time. Now some, some also saw that what he said was wrong, and they found fault with what Prabhupada said, and they gave reasons why. So it depends. Your desire gives you a certain under, leads you to a certain type of knowledge. You have to understand that whatever you desire, you're going to be directed in that way. And therefore, the, the, the fulfillment of your desire comes according to the quality of your desire. You can't desire pure devotional service at the same time want to enjoy the material world. I want to appear, be a pure devotee, but still, I want material happiness too. It just doesn't work. That means your that means your desire is not pure; it's mixed. But then again, there's another principle, and the other principle is: even if you have material desires, and you desire pure devotional service, if you don't act. Here's the point. If you don't act on those material desires, eventually they will diminish and at one point be eradicated and then your pure, your pure desire will manifest. So if you want to be free from the effects of material desire, just don't act on it. That's all. Don't try to fulfill your material. You may even be pushed in a direction of where you can fulfill your material desire, but then you, there's where your intelligence comes in and says, no, this is not what I want. I want Krishna, I don't want something less. Yes, Maharaj, this is very powerful. Yeah, Krishna consciousness is very powerful. <laughs> it's coming from the spiritual world. It's coming from Krishna himself. But Krishna is so kind that even if as a super soul, if somebody don't want to know and wants to go in the opposite direction, he, he directs the intelligence for that individual to then endeavor in the wrong way because of yeah. the desire that they had. Where, where, is, where are people getting the philosophy to, to validate their atheism? For Krishna. Krishna, yes. Krishna said, oh, you, you, don't want, you, you don't believe I exist and you want some knowledge of how, how I don't exist? Well, here it is. And they write books, they come up with theories and people believe it. They believe it also. So everything's based on desire. Desire leads in a certain direction, which fortifies our intelligence and it connects us with the results of that desire. So just desire Krishna, that's all. <laughs> and then you, you won't have any problems. 
And then Krishna will help you fulfill that desire by making arrangements in your life. This like sometimes we saw in our early days of Krishna consciousness when the devotees were first performing. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of uh, uh, energy and Prabhupada's you know, presence was so powerful. So devotees would sometimes think, wow, I want to surrender everything. I want to become a pure devotee. I want to give up everything. And, the, you know, they're, they're moved by the emotion of the, of the experience they're having. And then what happens is Krishna says, oh, all right. And he starts taking everything away. And then they get a little reluctant after a while. Oh, no, what's happening? I'm losing this. I'm losing that. I'm losing this. This doesn't have any meaning anymore. And then they get a little bit uh, frightened, <laughs> you might say. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute. I didn't want to go so fast. I'm not, you know, I changed my mind. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to be careful what you desire. But if you want Krishna, simply follow the process carefully and understand how to execute it. And then gradually you move away from you the materially and you gradually enter into the spiritual. Sometimes it happens all at once where all of a sudden you're on the spiritual platform. But because you still have some connection with the material energy, you can't maintain it. You fall back again to that. So better to go gradually, follow the process carefully. Now there's a danger in that also because you can go too slow and say, well, yeah, I'll just take my time and I'm not in a hurry. You know, I have a, a lot of time. I'll, I'll uh, like I knew one person we, we taught him how to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So he made a vow that every year he would add one round to his, you know. <laughs> so he started off with one round and after another, another year he was up to two rounds. The third year he was up to three rounds. <laughs> so I wanted to tell him, I think that's a little too slow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he wasn't willing to hear that and he wanted to do it at his own pace so you know you have to understand that the process works and it has a certain uh, method on how it works if you just plug in accordingly and Krishna will guide you along but keep your desire strong that's the important thing I want to become Krishna conscious. That's the whole thing. I don't want to really want to find, I don't want to look at this material world in a way that I'm attracted and still have a desire to enjoy it. We want to get rid of that desire to enjoy the material world in any form. There's gross forms of enjoyment. There's subtle forms. We talk about the four regulative principles, no, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meeting, no gambling. These are, of course, sinful, but they are the gross forms of trying to enjoy the material energy. Then you have the subtle forms, the ones you can't perceive so easily, but they exist. They're the root cause of the gross forms. Just like if you have some grass and you want to cut the grass, or you have some weeds and you want to cut the weeds. So you take out your machine or your, your sickle and you cut it. But because the root's still in the ground, it's going to grow back again. So we can stop our material gross activities and be free from them. But the subtle still remains. And they will remain as long as we don't go to the root and uproot them. That's why... When, you, when people commit a crime, they go to jail. When they go to jail and suffer, they come back out and they commit the crime again. Why? Because the desire is still there. That's why punishment is not a way to 
for correction. You don't correct the person by punishing, punishing them because the desire still remains. You have to uproot the desire. There's where the process of bhakti goes and uproots the cause of the both subtle and gross the desires. It uproots it where it is gone completely. For instance, sex desire. So we can give up sex desire. We can stop the activity on the gross level. But then what is the subtle form of sex desire? Adoration, profit, distinction. I want to be worshipped. I want to be adored. I want to be noticed. I want some kind of remuneration for the activities I perform. That's subtle sex. That's what it is. It's not gross sex, but it's subtle sex. And it's another form of material desires. And it still keeps one bound to the material world. Mm -hmm. So bhakti uproots both of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, how do you know? Wow, what a surprise. Thank you for a wonderful class, Marge. And thank you for the point you're making. So I was just making notes and now I wanted to ask about the subtle form of sex desire. So you talked about how it's the desire for adoration, profit distinction, the desire for wanting to be noticed. So could you share more on how we can uproot the subtle forms of sex desire, please? Well, that comes, there's two aspects to, to the uprooting process. One is the process itself, chanting the holy names of the Lord, following the principles, which gives us the spiritual direction and also gradually uproots it. But then again, being aware of these things and not acting upon them. And it was using the antidote that it's like, well, I want to be glorified. So let me glorify my spiritual master. Mm -hmm. Take that same desire and put it where it belongs. I want to glorify Krishna. I want to glorify the, my spiritual master. I want to glorify the devotees. Mm -hmm. I want to be served. That's also kind of a subtle sex desire. So let me serve others. Mm -hmm. So take that same principle that you want for yourself and give it to others. Mm -hmm. So glorification of the Lord glorification is, is an, a way to dovetail or redirect. But that each one of these principles are not uh, enough in and of themselves. They have to be combined. Mm -hmm. So just like the materialists, they will try to get rid of the, desire, the subtle desires just by uh, not acting upon them. But that's not enough. You have to have a process to uproot, and that is where the, the process of bhakti comes in. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord has to go along with redirecting these desires away from ourselves and towards the Supreme Lord and his pure devotees. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, when we notice them in ourselves, we simply don't acknowledge that that is actually, it's a shadow of our own existence that has nothing to do with ourselves. The soul by nature wants to serve. The soul by nature wants to glorify. The soul by nature wants to uh, experience the happiness of giving happiness to others. The nature of the soul. So when we see these things in ourselves, the, the subtle forms of sex desire, we can understand they're simply shadows of the gross forms of material existence. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. That makes complete sense. Thank you so much, Marge. Thank you. <laughs> Please comment. <laughs> no, no, what can I say, Mike? There's a perfect answer. I really, I very much appreciated this point about how Bhakti is the only process that can uproot, you know, from the from the foundation, the entire cause. And I, and I really appreciate this point that you also made that, um, 
me just go back to my notes. Yeah. So you talked about how if we desire Krishna, he'll help us to fulfill that desire. And so you talked about following the process carefully and also the understanding of how to execute it. And then we'll move more from the spiritual and more towards the and more from the material, sorry, and more towards the spiritual. Even if we're imperfect in the execution, but if we have the, the, the desire, Krishna will direct us in that way. So we can succeed simply by keeping the desire pure mm -hmm. and making an effort to, to fulfill that. And Krishna, through his energies, will, will fine tune our desire and, and direct it in the right way. Because he's fulfilling our desire. Mm -hmm. and, and can I ask one other question? So, Marit, related to this point, it, it very much falls or seems to me to relate to this idea of, of cultivating the Bhakti Lata beach properly and uprooting the weeds. So, is there anything more that you that you could share on that process of uprooting the weeds? Because we know that the weeds are Bhakti, Mukti, Siddhis, and material desires, desire for liberation, desire for you know, mystic perfections. And Prabhupada writes that sometimes these other creepers can seem similar to the to the creeper of devotion. So would you be able to share anything else, um, anything that you feel would be relevant on how on the on the on the process of uprooting those weeds? Hmm. Well, recognize them. Puja, Pratishta. Uh, there's a whole list in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. In chapter 19 of Madhya Leela, verse 159, gives all, gives six points of these subtle forms of material attachments, which may, as you as you hear and chant the glories of the Lord, you're also watering those uh, those weeds, because the watering process will go all not only on the, the plant but on the weeds too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, therefore, we have to recognize them and not give it any energy. But in the Bhagavatam, in the seventh canto, there's, there are antidotes or ways to counteract certain negative qualities. How do you overcome greed? How do you overcome lust? How do you overcome fear? How do you overcome pride? So, there's ways to uh, redirect these desires in a spiritual way through the process of bhakti. For instance, greed. If you're greedy, then become greedy for devotional service. <laughs> you can may you may not be able to get rid of that element of greed, but just connect it to Krishna. That's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have to do that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you talked about how the, the hearing and chanting it waters so it waters the weeds as well as the devotion. So you said that if we're if we're aware of the weeds, then it is the awareness the thing that stops the the hearing and chanting watering the weeds. In other words, if I'm aware, okay, don't do things for pratishta, don't do things for name, fame, distinction. If I'm conscious of that, then is that what makes the the process of hearing and chanting simply only only water the bhakti lata beach? Is that what stops the other weeds from being watered? Hmm. Well, just simply, I, I don't think that's enough. I think, I think association with devotees and acting, in other words, developing proper, uh, uh, what is it called? Sadachar. Mm -hmm. Developing sadachar, that is the etiquette of a Vaishnava, is the way to to put the foundation or put the conclusion on top of these weeds. In other words, in the association of devotees and in, along with chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we can learn how not to feed these weeds at the same time, uh, try to uproot it through the process of hearing and chanting. Mm -hmm. That's why association of devotees is yeah. so important because it helps to allows us not to act upon the, 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 the things that we would, would like to act upon when we're not in association of devotees. It's like sometimes devotees think, well, 
you know, being an association of devotees is, not, is difficult, but I, when I'm in association with non-devotees, I can be myself. <laughs> I, you know, they're not so judgmental. They just accept me. But they're just like you. I mean, they're, I mean, they're just, you're, you're just fulfilling your desires in that association. We're an association of devotees. You can't fill those inordinate desires. It just won't work. It becomes, it looks awkward. It becomes, if you try to be proud, pride, and then as soon as you try to act pride in this, you see it immediately. But if when you're with non devotees, you don't see it. <laughs> you can see it, oh my God, I'm acting proudly, or I'm acting in the wrong way, or I'm acting, uh, you know, I'm just focusing on myself instead of on Krishna. Mm -hmm. Association of devotees is more like a good mirror for our own an artist. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I ask one more question? Or if is if they have to close, I understand. I don't want to take time. No, time mm -hmm. is not is time is uh, you know we can take as much time as needed. Okay, so so I I have a query. So this is something I've seen over the years. So we sometimes have devotees who, because they may have been upset or 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 hurt in their exchanges or interactions with other devotees, they may be a bit critical. And and my question, Maharaj, you know, because obviously you're very you know elevating experience. How do how do we know the difference between someone who's revealing their mind because they may be upset, genuinely upset, as opposed to someone who's being offensive. And, and if they are being, if they are kind of crossing the line and they're being offensive, how do we help them to act properly, but, but maybe without coming across as, as lacking in empathy for their experience? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, you just have to ask them questions based on what they're saying. You 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 uh, you listen to what they're saying and then uh, go into the uh, question them of the of the reasoning behind what they're saying. Start mm -hmm. try to get to the root. Is mm -hmm. it uh, is it actually vindictive, offensive, or is simply some suppression of some desires that they're just revealing? So then you ask questions based on what they're saying. And that will reveal more of the knowledge of the root cause of why they're saying and what, what they're saying. <laughs> that usually works as a technique to get to the root of the understanding of why something is being said. <laughs> if we deal with just what's being said, that may not be enough. But what is the motivation behind it? So is that what makes the difference between being offensive and just revealing the mind? Is it that if the motive is not to put down the other person, but they're just upset about something, is that is that revealing the mind? As a, but but not quite. But it doesn't make it offensive. Is that? My, I just want to make sure I understand properly. Yeah, that's that that's understood by that in the question questioning. Thank and you. Much. You'll be able to see whether it's actually offensive or it's something that is just they're letting out some 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 hurt, some difficulty. Mm -hmm. And they'll also, they'll also speak that way too. They'll also say, well, I, you know, not, I don't want to be offensive, but this is how I feel. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. That's really, really useful work. Right, you are, you're really, you really are like a treasure chest of, of insight and knowledge. Thank you so much for it. For your for enlightening us very much. So they say they say when the, the moon comes into the sky, uh, uh, the sky becomes beautiful by the presence of the moon. You're the moon, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. No, I really mean that. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being with us. It's been a, it's a real treat just to have your association. No, it's, it's nectar to hear from you, Maharaj. Hear from you is nectar, and it's very enlightening. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I uh, 
it only increases my anxiety to, to get the association of devotees more and more. And so someday I hope to put it into a more uh, together arena. <laughs> I was, I was reading something, I was just doing some studying yesterday and I was reading this quote from the Chaitanya, um, from, from the Bhagavatam and it talks about the, the, how essential it is to hear from elevated devotees because they, their speech carries the, is the aroma of the saffron particles of the, of the lotus feet of the Lord. Yeah, and it, full, full canto, chapter 20 of the Bhagavatam. So I, I feel that way when we're hearing from you, Raj. It really has yeah. a transformative effect. You were, you were reciting Bhagavatam like Sugadev Goswami is reciting Bhagavatam. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Bhutavana Prabhu, uh, for your um, a nice discussion with Guru Maharaj. We, we all loved it. Thank you so much. Um, Devotees, if you have any more questions, uh, Sri Devi Mataji. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. Uh, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you. This has been such a powerful lecture and such a deep reminder that we are really not these bodies and we have nothing to do with this material world. I'm just uh, still uh, trying to absorb everything. And I would like to know the desire for achievement is a very deep, fruitive desire. And uh, when we try to dovetail that in Krishna consciousness, can we actually really dovetail it and say, I want to do this for Krishna? Or is it again a personal motivation which we are trying to disguise in the form of? I know at a subtle level, I'll get adoration, distinction, promotion. There's, and so I'm pretending. Yeah, the, the, that's easy. There's what we have, to, if we're not sure about the motivation behind or whether we should do or not do a particular activity, we should get clarification and direction from the spiritual master or someone who is on the, le on the level of the spiritual master. Yeah, this is what our process is. If we're on, if we're, our, our desires are mixed and we're not sure. Am I doing this to, for Krishna or am I doing mm. it for me? Yeah, that's a very heavy one actually. And that requires deep uh, consideration and direction and guidance. So thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, I mean, we can do so many services, but then there's that service the spiritual master sees is the best service for you how you can make progress in devotional service. And you might think, well, yeah, that's nice, but I, I'll do this other thing. And then when I'm ready, I'll do this other thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. It's the stubborn mentality of me, 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 rather than what Krishna wants, which keeps us bound to our own ideas of what we think we should do for Krishna. So I'm, I'm struggling with that, Guru Maharaj. I'm struggling with that and trying really to see this is not uh, the right way to do it. Yeah, just get to Mayapur. <laughs> you understand everything. Let's let me get to Slovenia, Guru Maharaj. That will be halfway across at least. <laughs> You're taking too long. Get there. <laughs> I booked my tickets. I did the first thing. I booked my tickets finally. I <laughs> mercy. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Um, Deepti Mataji, you want to ask any question? Yes, Devi. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you. Thank you for such a lovely class and discussion. And thank you, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, for your discussion as well, which is very enlightening. But in, in connection with Sri Devi Mataji's question, I, I have a question that so many times it happens that some, some senior devotees tell us that to divert our 
um, desires to do tell to Krishna, we can say that we will like you know for simple example like to if you fancy eating some food items, we can say that we can offer it to Krishna and have it as a prasad. Is it right attitude or is it something we shouldn't be doing it? We we have to understand dovetailing is not pure devotional service. It's just redirecting our consciousness in the right direction. We still mm -hmm. have that tendency to try to enjoy that particular thing, but in order so we don't get the reactions of that, we're moving it towards Krishna. But ultimately, we have to change and we get rid of that desire and accept the, the desire that Krishna wants for us. In other words, uh, it's no longer about what I want, it's about what, what Krishna wants. Before, it's uh, what I want, but I'll offer it to Krishna and that way I'll purify my desire. So dovetailing is simply the, a step before um, actually surrendering. Okay. So then you have to say, well, my my dear Lord, what the? Uh, how can I serve you? Mm -hmm. Just for example, we have the example. Srila Prabhupada said, you know, his spiritual master told him to go to the West and preach. Yes. And that was in 1922, mm -hmm. and again in 1936, before Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati left. But Prabhupada didn't get to the West until 1964. Mm -hmm. So in between there, he was still trying to preach in India. But everything mm -hmm. was going wrong. Because that wasn't what his spiritual master wanted. He felt that, you know, I'll preach in India for a while and then eventually I'll get to the West. Mm -hmm. But so he explains that himself in the same way that I'm explaining it. He said, you know, I was thinking I'll do something in India first and then I'll establish myself, then I'll go to the West. But then he said, that's not what my Guru Maharaj wanted. He simply said, go to the West. True. But then he said, you know, I was, I was all these years, I was just trying to do something. So he was trying to serve, but he wasn't serving exactly according to how you know, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had given him. Finally, he came to that understanding. And then he, when he did, then he became fully empowered to preach Krishna consciousness around the world. Before then, he couldn't even do anything in India. It's only when he came back to India after going to the West that he was able to really preach in India. Before then, he, everything he tried in India failed. And that was Bhakti Siddhanta's mercy, showing him that, that you know, this is not what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> but Prabhupada, you, he speaks about this himself. That is a very good example, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. That makes so much of sense. But uh, still, in, in the day to day life, how do we know what is expected of us like okay we do follow the four regulative principles that i do but then what else we should be doing for krishna so that it is it, it pleases krishna rather than like you know uh, thou telling our desires with krishna learning what krishna wants and then using your intelligence to apply that as you're applying yourself in the day-to-day -day life, you see what you're doing. Is it leading towards Krishna or is it leading away from Krishna? Okay. You have to use your intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's for the, you know, we can, we're not always in a position to inquire every minute about what we should do, nor is that practical. But, exactly. Yeah, what we want to do is we want to serve in the best possible way and we want to please Krishna. Or we want to elevate ourselves by our activities in devotional service. So you can see what will elevate you and what will, you know, keep you locked into the material energy simply by using your intelligence in your activities. If you're sincere, you'll do the right thing or you'll try to do the right thing. If you're insincere, you'll accept something else and say, well, it's okay because eventually I'll, 
get to the right thing. <laughs> Mm, true. So it's, it's a matter it's of scrutinize yeah. ourselves. Yeah, that's that's the word sincerity is mm -hmm. mentioned in the nectar of devotion as the foundation for all our activities in Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you want Krishna or you want something less? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing less than Krishna. <laughs> And you should be willing to do whatever it takes to yes, uh, get to that platform. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. That that really helps. Thank mm. you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. March, could you could you elaborate? Why is it that when we when we hear from sadhus that it has such a transformative effect on the consciousness? Can you elaborate on what what exactly what happens when one hears from advanced devotees? What's 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 the transformation that takes place, and why is it that their speech has such an effect? Because they're following what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the uh, the achar is backed by sadachar. Mm -hmm. And they're connected. They're not simply speaking their own words. They're, they're connected to, to Krishna, to their own spiritual master. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not delivering something of their own ideas. They're simply transparent via medias for their mm -hmm. spiritual master coming ultimately for, from Krishna. So you're getting that you're getting that, you, that that spiritual potency coming down from the source, not simply from a person who's speaking from their own mind and intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's why it's transformative. That's why Prabhupada used to say to his disciples, sometimes he would preach in in Hindi, mm -hmm. and then he, he, uh, his his devotees would be there, and sometimes they would get up and leave. Prabhupada said, "No, let's just listen." Because the sound vibration is purifying. Even though they don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> so it works like that with a great soul, yeah. It's transformative because of this, because of the connection with the Lord. Thank you, much. Does that make sense? Okay. You're, mu you're on mute, Buddha Bhavananda Prabhu. No, I heard him. I got it. It came through. Okay. Any more questions, devotees? Okay, I think uh, there are no more questions, Guru Maharaj. Uh, we are 40 minutes past the hour. Um, okay, tomorrow we're doing uh, the group with Charlotte, and it's, um, what is it, fifth canto? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Seventh um, chapter. Ninth chapter, Guru Maharaj. Fifth, fifth canto, ninth chapter, verses one and two. So that's tomorrow's class, and that's at... Um, 12.20 UK time. It's a change in, it's the Thursday time schedule. For those of you who can't sleep at night, who live in, the, in America, I'm giving Bhagavatam class in the morning here tomorrow. <laughs> so if you want to, if you feel like staying up, the class is at uh, for those of you who are in Eastern Standard Time in America, it's six hours earlier. For those of you who are in Central, it's seven hours earlier. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who are on my time or those of you who are in UK time, it's either 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. It's, and it's, also, it's through, uh, you know, Slovenia, Ljubljana, media yeah i think they have a connection here. sorry i just wanted to clarify is it so is, is it seven or eight o'clock uk time or is it 12 20 uk time well 
there's two classes. I mentioned both of them. Um, okay. the, the Bhagavatam class is at 7 a.m. UK time. And the one in the, the later Bhagavatam class, which is a regular Thursday schedule, it's at mm -hmm. uh, 12.20 UK time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and there's two different classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for a wonderful class. And um, thank you, Bhutta Bhavana Parvo, for your association and nice discussion. Thank you so much. Um, please give your association regularly for us. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bhutta Bhavana gives such inspiration. Just by his presence, he, he stimulates me. One of the discussions on very interesting topics. No, Marge, thank you for enlightening us. Honestly, the answers are fantastic. Very, very enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Lavanya, and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thank you so much. This knowledge is transforming. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Th